All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight we have All His Land is to be Mine, Nordic leader Umpanchella in the 17th century Connecticut Valley. Um, this program is presented, um, co-sponsored co by uh, Stork Library, Longmeadow uh, Adult Center, and the Longmeadow Historical Society. This is part of our Hidden Voices of History series that has been made possible through CARES Act funding to Federal Institute and Museum Library Services as administered by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Um, this is the final program in the uh, CARES Act sponsored series, um, but we will be continuing this work um, with more presentations of a similar nature uh, going forward. So tonight's program um, is brought is um, presented by uh, Strother E. Roberts. He is an assistant professor of history at Bowdoin College and the author of Colonial Ecology, Atlantic Economy, Transforming Nature in Early Modern New England. Um, he's going to talk to us um, with a specific antidote to kind of illustrate um, the steady disposition of Native American communities by the English. Um, again, with um, one particular story to demonstrate that. And um, Professor, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becky. Thank you for having me virtually this evening, um, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, of course, I'd also like to thank the Stores Library and the Longmeadow Historical Society and Longmeadow Adult Center. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I am speaking to you tonight from the ancestral homelands of the uh, pardon me, Arusagana Tukuk, uh peoples of the Abnaki Confederacy. I'm talking to, at least theoretically, the ancestral homelands of the Egawams. And of course, I will be talking about this evening, uh, primarily the ancestral homelands of the Norwetics, who lived just a little bit up the river from Longmeadow and from the Stores Library. Give me just a moment as I pull up my slides. Um, so thank you again, Be uh, Becky, for introducing me. My talk this evening is entitled, All His Land is to be Mine, Nowatuk Leader Umpunchula and the 17th Century Connecticut Valley. Um, and it's a talk that is drawn from a single anecdote, really a couple of sentences in my book that I published a couple of years ago, entitled, as Becky said, Colonial Ecology, Atlantic Economy. And it was a book that attempted to trace out how colonial New England's participation in commercial networks that connected it to Europe, to the West Indies, and even to Asia, how participation in these commercial networks incentivized um, ecological changes within the New England landscape. And the anecdote that I'm starting with is from a quotation that I used in the book. Um, the title obviously comes from the end of this quotation, his uh, all his land is to be mine. The longer quotation is, if I am not paid in beaver when he, Ampunchula, comes from Hikeg, all his land is to be mine. And this is an entry from one of the account books of trader John Pinchon of Springfield, Massachusetts, dated December 25th, 1660. And I want to open with this quotation because there's actually a lot to unpack here in just this extremely short sentence. Um, the place I want to start is actually with the fact that this quotation, um, this history that I want to give you of Umpunchula is actually coming from an account kept by John Pynchon. Umpunchula himself does not seem to have been literate. He came from an illiterate society, which is why I've chosen him to speak about as one of these hidden voices of history. And when Becky asked me if I could give this talk, she especially asked if I could present on a hidden history of Connecticut Valley uh, a hidden voice of Connecticut Valley history, and Umpunchella very much fit the bill. Um, I bring up this quotation from John Pinchon because it's hard to escape that as I'm trying to put together a history of Umpunchella and even of the Norwetic people, it's always going to be mediated through an English voice. And as I put together a history of Umpunchella, as a matter of fact, his historical identity is always mediated, is always being presented through his business and other transactions with this one English figure, with John Pynchon. 
a lot of what we know, as a matter of fact, comes from the pen of John Pynchon, um, which is why when I uh, originally pitched this talk to Becky, I pitched not the title that you see here, and that was on the original title card that I started with, but the title, All His Land is to be Mine, what Norwetic leader Umpunchila's dealings with John Pynchon can tell us about the 17th century Connecticut Valley all as a way to emphasize the fact that what little we know about Impuntula from the historical record, almost all of it comes from John Pynchon, which is to say that my talk quite inconveniently centers around two men, two historical figures for which we don't have portraits. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's fair to say that one of these figures is far more well represented within the historical record. Um, far more, uh, far more represented in written histories. Um, one of these figures has more of a voice in these written histories than the other. Uh, while we might say that Umpuntula is a hidden voice of history, John Pynchon is very much not. Uh, some of you might actually be familiar with the name of John Pynchon. John Pynchon was from the mid 17th century up through the late 17th century very much the premier English figure in Western Massachusetts. He was the wealthiest merchant in Western Massachusetts. He was the largest landowner in uh, Western Massachusetts, at the very least the largest English landowner in Western Massachusetts. He was a magistrate on the Hampshire County um, uh, Court. He was the colonel of the county militia and really, other historians have shown that a lot of the business that went on in the West, in Western Massachusetts during this period, almost all of it, I should say, went through the hands of John Pynchon. He's the man who had the commercial uh, contacts in Hartford, the commercial contacts in Boston, the commercial contacts back, back in England to be able to import large amounts of European goods into the Connecticut Valley. He's the man who had the contacts to take what was being produced in the valley, whether that was agricultural goods being produced on English farms, whether that was being was timber being chopped down by English lumberjacks, or whether that was furs being collected by Native American hunters. He's the man who had the contacts to ship all of that back out into the Atlantic world, back to Europe, or back to the West Indies. So Pynchon, although we don't have a portrait of him, is far from a hidden voice of history, unlike Umpuntula. Now, if you need a figure to focus on, if it helps you to have a picture of these men, the closest we have for John Pynchon is a portrait of his father, William Pynchon, the man who actually founded Springfield, Massachusetts, but who left the Connecticut Valley in the 1650s, to go back to England, where later in the 1650s, he had his this portrait made. Um, when he left, he of course left all of his lands and his business interests to his son, John, who carried on and expanded the family business. The other image is a portrait from an anonymous painter of an anonymous Native American leader that has been dated roughly to the late 17th century. So the best I can do for a contemporary portrait of Ampunchula is not his father or any relative of him, but this individual who came from the same world, or at least came from a similar political world as Ampunchula. Um, if we look at this man, we can see that he's engaged in the fur trade, as we know Ampunchella was. We know this because he seems to have a knife sticking out of his waistband. He's also wearing a um, medal of the sort that usually would have a design inscribed on it, but is of the sort that European traders and European officials often gifted to Native American leaders who they were trading or who they were negotiating with. Uh, we also know he's a leader because he's wearing a good deal of wampum. Um, these purple and white beads that you can see making up his headband and making up the string on which he has um, hung his medal or his gorget. And these help set him off as a leader. Uh, wampum was, on the one hand, very important in the fur trade between the English or between the Dutch and Native American trading partners. It acted as a kind of currency between Europeans and Native American traders. Um, but it was also extremely important as a symbolic item within Native American diplomacy. So Native American nations um, in the Northeast, when they negotiated with each other, often negotiations were opened with an exchange of gift, gifts, and in many cases, wampum. Um, was part of this gift giving 
um, uh, more powerful native nations in the Northeast, if they subjugated a weaker nation, um, if they defeated them militarily or otherwise subjugated them, often they required that tribute be paid by the subjugated nation. And in many cases, this tribute was paid in wampum, was required to be paid in wampum. So this was very, a very politically and sim, uh, symbolically, politically important commodity. And it's one that marks this man as a leader among his people, though again, we don't know who's people those were, since he is an anonymous individual whose name has not survived history. Um, the best I have for Umpuncella himself is this rendering um, done by the artist Francis Back for the Pecumtuck Valley Memorial Association in Deerfield, Massachusetts, uh, a few years back, that shows Umpuncella and obviously draws for inspiration on that earlier late 17th century portrait of a Northeastern Native American leader. It presents Ampunchula as, um, again, a sachem or a leader among his people. We can tell this both because he is wearing, again, a gorget or a medal that indicates he's taking part in the fur trade, in the trade with Europeans. We can see he's once again given this necklace of wampum that helps mark him out as a leader. And he's also wearing this uh, very stylized coat, this coat that obviously draws its inspiration from the military jackets of 17th century European armies. And this is a type of coat that European traders or officials often gave to Native American leaders with whom they were negotiating or doing business to mark those Native American leaders off as leaders of their people. And it's the type of coat that we know Umpanchila um, over the course of his life and during his time as a trader trading with John Pynchon, we know he received several coats of this sort. So this is sort of the best guess representation that we have of Umpanchula. Um, now, moving forward from there, while it's hard to present you with an image of Umpanchula, it's also very hard to provide you with a history of his life because we do, as I mentioned, have very spare sources, really only a handful of sources that mention him. Most come from one man, one Englishman, John Pynchon, and all of them seem to involve John Pynchon and his business interests in some way. All of which is to say that from the historical sources that we have, we can only get at so much of Umpanchila's history. We can't get at his personal thoughts to a large degree. We can't get at his emotional life. Um, we don't know about his family, other than the fact that uh, Margaret Bruchak and her research has found that he probably had a grandson still alive in the 1690s who still lived in the ancestral lands of the Norwetics. Um, we don't know a lot about him as a man. Um, what we can know about him is we can deduce that he probably came from a leadership lineage. That is, that he came from a family of leaders. So he probably had um, aunts, uncles, a mother, a father, some sort of figure in his immediate family who had acted as a sachem or a leader of the Norwetics uh, at some point in his young life. Or if he didn't actually come from the Norwetics, he may have come from a leadership family from some other native nation nearby and have married in to the Norwetics. Um, but regardless, he was probably the son or the nephew of someone who had earlier been a leader either of the Norwetoks or of a neighboring native nation. So his lineage helped present him as a candidate for leadership among the Norwetoks, but his lineage wasn't enough to make him a leader. In the Native American nations of the Northeast, including the Norwetoks, um, what made someone a leader was that people chose to follow them. And this is extremely important for understanding the choices that we're going to see Umpanchella making once I turn to the primary sources that we do have for him. It's important to remember that to remain a leader, to maintain his authority, he essentially had to keep the people who chose to follow him happy. He had to fulfill their needs. He had to make choices to the best of his ability to benefit and secure the future of his people, the Norwetics. Um, so that's worth taking into consideration as we look at the choices that he makes within the historical record. And you may have noticed that I've labeled him Sachem of the Norwetics, and I've labeled him 
as being in power from only 1657 to 1661. Um, so don't take these as uh, his birth and death years. He did not die at the age of four. Um, these are the years that we know he was a sachem of the Norwetics because we have written records attesting to it. Now, he may well have been a sachem before this. I think he probably wasn't a sachem prior to 1654. I think he was fairly young, a fairly young man. Um, when he came, uh, when he enters the, the historical record, because there's a deed in 1653 where several Norwetic sachems sell land to John Pinchon, and Unpunchello was not among them. So I think he was probably a young man who came into his sachemship, his leadership position, sometime in the mid 1650s. And then we only have him in that record until 1661. And after 1661, he disappears, which doesn't mean he died, which doesn't mean that he lost his leadership position. It just means that after that, he no longer enters um, the uh, historical record. So we only have this short window of time when we can look at him and try and trace out his life history. So just to ground us, when I'm talking about the Norwetics, uh, which is also pronounced sometimes the Nunatux. I'm talking about the land seen in this left-hand rectangle roughly. So the land that will go on to become uh, Northampton, Hadley, South Hap Hadley, and part uh, Hatfield. And what most of the historical record we have in Umpancella is, is Umpancella selling these lands, alienating these lands. So basically the historical sources we have on Umpancella are sources that tell the story of how the landscape we see on the left, at least I hope it's on your left, the native landscape is transformed into the landscape of New England, how Nunatuck or Nawatic lands are transformed into English towns. So we have only a few sources on Umpunchula. As a matter of fact, we can take all of the sources we have written on Mpuncha and collect them into really just a few PowerPoint slides, which is exactly what I've done here. Um, just to walk you through what we have on them, in 1657, we know that Mpunchala sold a small parcel of land to the town of Northampton. And we know that Northampton paid for this purchase um, largely with wampum that was advanced to the town by trader John pension. Now we know that the actual deed that got recorded wasn't quite right. Um, in 1658, Umpunchula goes before the Hampshire County Court and complains that what actually got written down was different than the oral agreement he had reached with the leaders of North Hampton. He's saying that what he actually agreed to didn't make it into the deed. And we don't have the um, information about exactly what got left out. We just know that when this case was heard before the Hampshire um, County Court, which was headed by Magistrate John Pynchon, that Pynchon and the other two judges who heard the case um, sided with Mpunchula. They recognized that what actually got written down in this Northampton deed did not properly re um, represent what had been orally agreed to, and so they awarded damages to Mpunchala in the value of 14 shillings. So roughly increasing the purchase price of this territory by about 50% over what he had received in 1657. Mpunchala next enters the written record in December of 1658, when he, along with two other sachems of the Norwatex, sell another parcel of land to John Pynchon. We see him again in the historical record in 1659 when Mpunchula begins taking items on credit from John Pynchon. So he goes to John Pynchon, who is the premier trader in this part of the Connecticut Valley, and he begins taking items from Pynchon on credit. Cloth, knives, uh, various types of items, and he promises that he'll pay Pynchon back and he offers up a tract of land um, next to the Connecticut River as collateral. And we know that in July, Mpunchula actually sells this tract of land uh, to uh, John Pynchon. Um, and the lands that he sell are part of what's enclosed here by this dashed green rectangle. Now, we know that in August, 
Ampuntula is fined by Magistrate Pension Nine Fathoms of Wampum for public drunkenness. So we get a little view of Ampuntula as the man. Um, giving in, having a little bit too much to drink, uh, apparently making something of a scene of himself on this one occasion in public and being fined by John Pynchon for doing so, just as John Pynchon over the course of this year and uh, most years he was magistrate, had to fine um, Englishmen often for public drunkenness um, as well. Now, 1616, uh, 1660 is a very busy year because by September we have Ampuntula again, beginning to essentially mortgage other lands in order to again purchase trade items on credit from John Pynchon. And over the course of September up through December of 1660, we see Ampuntula coming back to John Pynchon and we see other Norwatuk Indians coming on Ampuntula's behalf to John Pynchon acting, uh, pardon me, asking for more trade goods to be advanced against this piece of land, or rather these several pieces of land that Umpuntula has effectively um, mortgaged to John Pynchon against his promise to pay back what he is being uh, advanced. And that brings us up to the quotation that I opened with. That brings us up to December 25th of 1660, when John Pynchon recorded in his book, almost gloatingly, if I am not paid in beaver, when um, Punchula comes from Hekeg, all his land is to be mine. And not to give away the ending, but we are going to see that um, Punchula does not come back with the beaver, uh, that is the furs he needs to pay off his account to John Pynchon. Um, but what this sentence also tells us is that Ampuntula has left the land of the Norwoduks here at the end of 1660, that he has traveled up to what John Pynchon records as Hekeg, which is actually Squawkeg, um, which lies about 30 some miles north of the Norwoduk lands in the Connecticut River Valley. It's probably more than 30 miles, um, somewhere in the 40 miles, um, as the river flows. And Ampuntula most likely has gone by river, uh, rowing north in a canoe, possibly alongside other Nuwataks uh, going along with him, carrying the trade goods that he got from, um, got from John Pynchon, carrying them north to Squawkeg in order to hopefully, as the quotation we saw on the previous slide said, trade them for beaver. And what you have to understand is that while Squawkeg is maybe only 40 some miles north as the river flows, the distance between Norwoduk and Squawkeg politically and culturally is much larger. Squawkeg is the southernmost outpost of the Abenakis within the Connecticut River Valley. And the, and the Abenakis are a broad range of native nations who are tied together by history by similar dialects, by um, a shared culture, and by very thick, uh, and by very thick ties, uh, political, commercial, and social ties. Um, there's a lot of intermarriage among the various nations of the Abnakis. And these are, this is a commercial network essentially that stretches north into Abnaki lands in what is today Vermont, into what is today New Hampshire, east into what is today um, Maine and even farther east possibly into the lands of the eastern Wabnaki peoples like the Passamaquoddy and possibly even the Micmacs farther north and farther east. So this is potentially a truly vast trade networks, uh, trade networks, trade net network, pardon me, of hunters who are hunting beaver, hunting other fur bearers and funneling them west and south into the Connecticut River Valley, south down to Squawkeg, where hopefully, or it's Ampunchula's hope, he can go buy these furs and act as a middleman carrying them back down river to John Pynchon. So really, if we go back to this quotation, Pynchon is obviously focused on getting Ampunchula's land. Ampunchula is almost certainly focused on protecting the lands of the Norwoduks by getting these beaver with which to pay off his debt and by extension the Norwoduks debt, debt to 
pension with, uh, and hopefully not having to sell these mortgaged lands. Unfortunately, for the Nowatuks and for Ampunchula, we know that sometime in very late December, he sends word back south to Pynchon saying that he will not be able to pay off his account. He was not able to collect enough furs to pay off his account with Pynchon. And so in very early 1661, in January of 1661, Pynchon acts as the middleman in the sale of Ampunchula's lands to representatives from the town. Of Hadley. And now when we reach this point, and this is the last point at which Ampunchula enters the historical record, the written historical record, at this point from the perspective of the 21st century, it looks very much like Ampunchula made a mistake, like he made bad choices. And we can entertain the, the, the argument that that is in fact True. Um, I'm going to suggest, as I go on with my talk, that we really have to understand the historical context he was operating in and see that within the, the historical context that he was able to recognize, he was making what seemed like a safe bet. He was making the bet that he thought would actually best protect the land base of the Norwata community. It's just a bet that didn't work out. But even as he sold these lands to Pinchon, to Norwodic, uh, pardon me, to Northampton, and to Hadley, uh, Ampunchula and his fellow sachems among the Norwodics did their best to protect the livelihoods of the Norwodic people. So if we look at all of these deeds and treaties, what we see is that in most of the the legitimate deeds. So I'm excluding the 1657 deed um, to Northampton that we know something was wrong with. But if we look at the sale of lands in 1658, the Norwatics, it states that the Norwatics doth reserve and keep one cornfield, and also they reserve liberty to hunt deer, fowl, and etc., and to take fish, beaver, or otter, etc., in the lands that they sold. If we look at the 1660 deed, um, they doth reserve their planting ground together with liberty to hunt deer or other wild creatures, to take fish and to set wigwams on the commons and take wood and trees for use. And at the 1661 deed, um, Punchula has granted to him five acres within these lands that he's selling that were to be plowed and fenced by representatives from the town of Hadley. So if we look at these, we it's fairly obvious that even though Ampunchula is making decisions to sell these lands, he does not expect the Norwatuks to give up their homes. He personally doesn't expect to leave the area. He expects to remain in residence. He's making sure that even as most of their lands are being signed over to the English, the Norwatuks still have access to planting lands, still have access to lands on which they can plant. Uh, their corn and other crops. They still have access to hunting territories. They still have access to places to fish, to cut firewood. They even have access to areas to hunt beaver and otter um, so that they can continue, hopefully, to participate in the fur trade. So what I'm going to suggest is we have to view Ampunchula, um, the sachem of the Norwatics, whose life we only see this window into from 1657 to 1661. We have to see him as a local leader who's trying to look out for the best interests of his community, but he's a local leader who is being forced to act within both global and regional networks of commerce and diplomacy. So what, are, what does this mean? Well, I wanna look at three outside factors that are influ influencing how Umpanchella is making his decisions and that ultimately influence um, how these decisions work out. Uh, the first is the influence of disease on the history of the Connecticut River Valley in the 17th century. The second is the influence of incoming European traders and European settlers in the valley and in New England more generally. And the third is a context of regional political instability in which um, Punchula and the Norwatuks are operating, are making these decisions. And of course, as you might guess, um, the first two of these factors, disease and European trade and settlement, very much contribute to the third factor, regional political instability within New England over the course of most of the 17th century. So if we start with disease, we know that in the 1630s, in the mid-1630s, 
a terrible, terrible smallpox epidemic struck the Connecticut Valley, um, the lower valley, the upper valley, and also struck uh, large sections of New England. Besides, we have a record of this from, uh, well, from various English records, but we have one from Governor William Bradshaw of Plymouth, who wrote of the smallpox epidemic in Of Plymouth Plantation, in which he recorded that it pleased God to visit these Indians. And here he's talking about an unidentified Indian village somewhere in the Connecticut Valley, north of, Hart of um, Hartford and Windsor, Connecticut. He said, it pleased God to visit these Indians with a great sickness and such a mortality that of a thousand, above nine and a half hundred of them died. So Bradshaw is suggesting that the smallpox epidemic that hits the Connecticut Valley in the 1630s when Ampunchula was probably still a young boy somewhere in his teens, um, maybe tweens for that matter, that this great sickness carried off maybe 95% of the region's Native American population. Um, other scholars looking at this period and at the smallpox epidemic of the 1630s have suggested figures closer to 25% um, mortality, maybe 30% mortality, maybe as high as 60% mortality. But whatever number is accurate, we're still talking about a level of death, a level of tragedy that we would expect to shake any society, that would be we would expect to strain the, the political landscape and diplomatic landscape of the places, places that it's striking. We'd also expect this degree of loss to have wide ranging economic consequences. And in fact, we see that. What we see is in the Connecticut Valley and other regions of New England is that after this plague and other plagues that, uh, after this epidemic and other epidemics that hit the region, many Native American nations um, abandon some of their villages. Survivors gather together. They centralize, they coalesce into villages, often which they surround with palisades because this disease shakes up diplomatic relationships and, uh, and in many areas of New England leads to turmoil. They centralize their population and they abandon many of their outlying agricultural fields, something that will still be relevant in the 1650s. So if we look at all of the lands that Ampunchula and other sachems of the Norwatuks are selling, it looks to us from the 21st century, knowing what's going to come after, that selling these lands that alienating part of these native homelands to English invaders, it seems like a bad idea, but from the perspective of even the 1650s, when native populations have only just begun to bounce back, it makes a certain amount of uh, sense to take these lands which are no longer under cultivation because you have fewer mouths to feed. It makes a certain amount of sense to trade away some of these lands. Um, the next uh, outside factor, of course, that I want to focus on is what's referenced here, the beaver trade or the broader fur trade of New England in the 17th century. Um, a trade that Umpunchula himself was, of course, um, involved in and that John Pynchon had his fingers all over. So when English settlers first came to what will become New England, they looked around and one of the first commodities they identified as a potential staple commodity to help sort of pay for their colony building enterprise was furs. They looked around, they saw large numbers of beavers, they saw large numbers of other fur bearers like um, river otters, like martens, like woodchucks, like fox, like etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And they looked at this fur wealth and they imagined that they could harvest it and send it back to Europe and make enough money to help pay for the, the tools that they needed to build their colony, for the consumer goods that they wanted so that they could reproduce their lives back in England. And they knew that there was a ready market back in England and indeed back in Europe more broadly. Um, the 17th century was part of the epic of climate change that climatologists and historians today refer to as the Little Ice Age. Basically, it was a period of 200, maybe 200 and a half, uh, 250 years of cooler and wetter weather 
in the Northern Hemisphere, which meant that furs were an extremely desirable commodity throughout this entire period. And beaver in particular becomes very fashionable in the 17th century and continues to be very fashionable into the 18th century in Europe and in large sections of Euro America. Beaver hats in particular are all the rage um, for elites like James I, his son Charles I. They're also all the rage. They're always also highly demanded among the professional classes in England, among the merchant class in England, um, among men like these you see in the left-hand image, um, the jurors who actually sat in judgment of King Charles I during his treason trial and eventually decided to cut off his head. Um, as a matter of fact, they were so fashionable and they were so much of a can't do without it fashion, fashion item that the head judge in Charles I's treason trial actually had himself a special beaver hat constructed. He had um, steel plates sewn, constructed into the crown, and then beaver felt placed over it to help uh, protect him against any uh, assassination attempts, against anyone who might try to come at him with a sword or possibly even come at him with a musket or pistol. So he made himself essentially an armored beaver hat to wear while he was sitting in trial over the king. And beaver hats continued to be the height of fashion, even into the reign of Charles I's son, Charles II, who was restored to the throne in 1660, which, of course, just happens to be the same year that Umpuncella reaches this deal with John Pynchon. This deal whereby he will provide beaver to John Pynchon in, fa in, um, in exchange for these goods that have been advanced or if he fails to do so, he'll give up some of some more of the Norwetic lands. Now, I've said that the English were very quick, very eager to exploit the fur wealth of North America, of New England in particular, but they were not really interested in doing the work, the hunting of beaver and other fur bearers themselves. For example, William Wood, who was one of the earliest settlers of the Massachusetts colony, wrote that these beasts are too cunning for the English. All the beaver which the English have comes first from the Indians. And indeed, European traders found that their Native American trading partners were often very eager to hunt beaver and to exchange them with these European traders. And this image might give you some idea of why. If you look at what seem to be the metal-headed axes and metal-headed spears of the hunters in this image, you get an idea of why uh, Native Americans may have wanted to trade with Europeans. They did so because a lot of the technologies they were getting from European traders, a lot of the European trade goods they were receiving for their beaver furs, their marten, their fox, etc., were superior to the technologies that they'd been working with previously. Um, now, this goes for metal-headed axes as much as for metal-headed spears, for metal knives, for firearms and other weapons. It's also true of um, metal cooking utensils, metal cooking vessels like copper kettles, example. Uh, Native American communities were also very, uh, very highly desirous of obtaining European cloth, whether linen or woolens, because these were all commodities that made life easier for Native American communities. It was easier, easier to cut with a metal knife, easier to cut with a metal ax, um, having um, European linens or woolens may, means that meant that women had to produce less clothing for their community themselves. Having European metal cooking vessels meant that cooking took less time and was easier. So these were all commodities that were very much welcomed in Native American communities. And over time, what we see is that these Native American communities come to expect these trade items. Um, it becomes expected that one role of a leader within native Northeastern societies is to grant their community access to these trade goods. So if we look at the context of the Norwetics, as the Norwetics participate in this fur trade over the course of the 30s, 40s, going into the 50s, and eventually 60s, 
they come to expect that their leaders will secure them access to these sorts of trade goods, which is to say that in order to retain his authority within Norwetic society, in order to serve the Norwetic people that he leads, one of the expectations of, um of Ampunchula is that he will be able to grant them access to traders like John Pynchon and to the fur trade. Now, the problem that you might begin to suspect is that hunting beaver uh, to sell to Europeans leads to a decline in beaver populations in the Connecticut Valley and the rest of New England. I've estimated in, that, in my work that over the course of the 17th century from the 16 teens, when the Dutch first began trading in the Connecticut River Valley to the 1670s or 80s, probably about 500,000 or half a million beaver pelts were exported from the Connecticut River Valley over the course of these years. Um, this trade peaks in the 1650s. Um, for John Pynchon and his account books, this trade peaks in 1654. And, and after that period, the regional fur trade enters a decline because the regional fur supply has begun to decline significantly and beaver populations and populations of other fur bearers are very much in decline and perhaps exhausted by the time of the 1670s and 1680s. And of course, you might notice that the year in which Ampunchula makes this deal with John Pynchon that I'm focusing with, uh, focusing on is past this peak period and is moving towards this period when beaver are harder and harder to find, when the fur trade is becoming less and less commercially viable. As a matter of fact, um, in my work, I found that beaver and other and most other fur bearers were probably gone from the lands of the Agawams, um, on whose lands uh, William Pinchon founded Springfield, that beaver were probably gone from the Springfield area sometime in the 1630s. They were probably hunted out and gone from Norwetic lands by the 1640s or at latest the early 1650s. And of course, this is why Ampunchula, when he makes this deal with John Pynchon, doesn't just hunt in his own territory, doesn't just turn to the hunters of his own community and ask them to hunt the beaver he would need to pay back John Pynchon. This is why he makes this trek north to Squawkhead. And it's entirely possible that by 1660, there aren't a lot of beaver around Squawk Egg either, that um, this area has also been hunted out. But of course, Squawk Egg, um, going to Squawk Egg, gives him access to this vast Abenaki trading network to the north that stretches farther north into New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and et cetera. So he's probably hoping that even though beaver had disappeared from the Wettick lands, he could find uh, beaver to trade in Squawk Egg. And like I've said, or at least like I've hinted at, this was would have seemed like a safe bet. While the beaver trade that John Pynchon did peaked in 1654, he was still getting large numbers of furs from the Norwetics as late as 1657 and 1658. So Ampunchula, um, looking at the experience of the fur trade just a couple of years earlier, would have it would have been fair for him to think that he could make this deal with Pinchon and succeed, that he would be able to make this deal with Pinchon, travel north to Squawkeg, collect Abnaki hunted furs, bring them back to Pinchon, pay Pinchon off, and still make a profit on the furs that he had brought back. It's even possible this is what he was trying to do back in 1659 when he also got an advance of goods against the collateral of um, a section of lands that he ended up selling. So he's probably, in fact, trying to protect the land base of the Nerwatux, um, already being in um, debt to Pinchon. He has to find some way to pay Pinchon off, and he's betting that he can find these beaver in Squawk Egg and pay Pinchon in beaver instead of in land. Now, this is all complicated, again, by the fact that, as I stated, the political situation in New England in the 17th century is very un.
stable. And it's unstable because of the English, it's unstable because of uh, Dutch designs on New England, but it's also unstable because of the um, expansionism of the Mohawks, uh, the easternmost nation of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois League. They have also entered into the fur trade by the 1620s, really by the um, 16 aughts and the 16 teens, trading with the Dutch out of New York, out of the Hudson River Valley. And in the 1620s, the Mohawks begin pushing beyond their own hunting territories, seeking new areas in which to hunt beaver and other fur bears. They begin pushing east and even into the lands of the Connecticut watershed, where they run up against the Sakakis, um, whose primary village is Squawkeg, where they run up against the Kawasucks, the Pinnacucks, and the Pocumptucks. And these nations all form an alliance to try and keep the Mohawks out of the Connecticut River Valley. But the Mohawks prove stronger than this alliance. Um, they deal some sort of military defeat to the Kalsuk, Sakakis, Pinnacooks, and Pocumtucks, and force all of them to pay a tribute annually in both furs and wampum. Around the same time, we know that the Norwoodoks also begin paying tribute to the Mohawks in furs and wampum. Um, it doesn't seem like the Norwetics went to war and were conquered by the Mohawks, but it seems likely that perhaps in order to avoid a war, the Norwetics may have agreed to pay tribute to the Mohawks. So in the 1620s, what we see is some furs from the Connecticut River Valley actually begin to be directed west into the hands of the Mo Mohawks, into the hands of Dutch traders in the Hudson River Valley. Over the course of the 1620s and the 1640s, Mohawk hunters range far and wide, at least along the western banks of the Connecticut River and throughout its tributaries flowing in from the west, essentially competing with Abnaki and Pico, uh, pardon me, Pocumtuck fur hunters for the furs of the Connecticut River Valley. In the 1650s, though, things changed. The Mohawks um, having hunted out a lot of the beaver in these westernmost tributaries, turn their attention farther north, uh, turn their military attention especially farther west, and they kind of leave the Connecticut River Valley nations alone, which means that over the course of the 1650s, the Connecticut River Valley very much bounces back, and not only bounces back, but reaches its highest levels. Again, reaches its highest level sometime around 1654. So these favorable political developments allow these nations, the Kalsucks, the Sakakis, the Pinnacooks, to send their furs that they're trapping um, west and south. Um, some of them collected at Squawkug, some of them sent on to Pocumtuck, but this allows for the Norwatuks over this period of the mid-50s into 57 and 58 to actually trade with Squawkeg and actually bring back furs to John Pynchon. All of which is to say that in 1659, when Umpunchula takes an advance from Pinchon, in 1660, when Umpunchula takes an advance from Pinchon, it seems like a good bet that he can continue to collect furs at Squawkeg and bring them south. Now we know it's not. And one reason it's not may have been because beaver during the, the sort of um, high times of the 1650s have been hunted out. It's very possible that Umpunchula, operating in 1659 and 1660, is basically on the wrong side of the tipping point between where beaver are still available in large quantities throughout the Abnaki lands and um, on the other side of that line, the period where there is so much in decline that the fur trade becomes no longer commercially possible. So this might, so it's possible Umpunchula is just experiencing bad timing in that respect. It also seems like he's experiencing bad timing politically. Uh, sometime in the early 1660s, and maybe as early as 1660 itself, Mohawk hunters return to the Connecticut River watershed, uh, sparking violence with the Secaucus, with the Pocumtucks, with the Kalasucks, so that by 1664, the Mohawks actually destroy Squawkeg, destroy Pocumtuck. And it seems extremely possible that the this unrest started as early as 1660 and might have negatively influenced the trade between these nations and the Norwatuks in 1660 when Umpunchula arrived 
hoping to buy enough furs to pay off John Pynchon. So basically, what I'm trying to present is this story of Ampunchula um, as a local leader who's doing his best to serve the interest of his community, to give them access to the consumer and the economic goods that they desire, that they need to maintain their way of life, um, that he's doing his best to serve his community, but he's acting within this, these global and regional networks that at least in 1659 and certainly in 1660, seem to be working against him. It seems like his timing is bad. It seems like this bet that he's making, while in previous years it might have worked out, by 1660 certainly, um, it's a failure. It's a bad bet, probably because fur yields are in decline, something he couldn't have known was happening in Abnaki lands at that time, and possibly because of the return of Mohawk aggression into the northern Connecticut River Valley, again, something he couldn't easily have predicted. But even while he makes this bad bet, even while in his efforts to maintain the land base by um, trading in furs and not land, even if he fails in this, we still know that he protects his people, that together with his co-sachems of the Norwatoks, they protect at least part of the resource base. They ensure that the Norwatoks can continue to hunt, can continue to plant, can continue to um, grow corn, can continue to fish, can continue to collect firewood. So even if after this, the Norwatoks are largely shut out of the fur trade, even if they see their land base eroded, at least he's ensured that they still have access to these resources. And even after the Norwatoks um, sell further lands in 1662, and Umpunchula isn't a part of this land sale, even after that, they still have access to these resources and these other lands that had been deeded where rights to resources had been reserved. And the Nowetics continue to exploit these resources, continue to live um, around Northampton and Hadley, at least until the 1690s, we know. Um, as I mentioned previously, Margaret Bruchak has shown that at least one of Ampunchula's descendants, a grandson, was still living in the lands of Hadley and still hunting there, uh, taking advantage of these deed rights. Um, and the Noetics continue to live and operate in their homeland, even through the violence of King Philip's War in the 1670s, even up through the violence of King William's War in the 1690s, even as the English expand across New England, and even when they are kicked out, even when they are expelled, such as during the violence of King William's War in the 1690s, in many cases, individuals and families return again and again throughout the 18th century and even into the 19th century, taking advantage of these reserved rights to hunt fish camp and take firewood that had been negotiated by Umpunchula when he was trying to protect the land base of his people back in the 1650s and 1660s. That's the end of my talk, so thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I've already got some applause in, uh, applause emoji in the audience. I'm gonna turn on the option for everyone uh, to use their mics if they so choose. Um, again, please feel welcome to turn on your cameras or your mics if you're comfortable. Um, uh, just a reminder, this is being recorded and everyone is welcome to use the chat box as well if you have any questions or comments that um, you'd like to share. Um, so while we wait to see if we have any questions that pop up, um, so at the end you talked a little bit about you know how they continue to have those um, reserve rights, but do you have any numbers or any other anecdotes about how how it changes over time? Once, like, I guess, um, the difference between the access to the resources versus the authority over them, and really um, what autonomy they have or don't have, and how that affects them. Well, their autonomy is, as you might suggest, limited, and other. Historians have written a lot about this, um, done a better job than I can give sort of right here and now. Uh, Gene O'Brien, for example, and Margaret Bruchak, who I mentioned, have noted how many histories of New England, New England towns, including the Connecticut Valley, that are written over the course of the 19th century, um, basically state that Native American peoples were gone um, from 
to Northampton or Hadley region, for example, by the 1660s when these lands are deeded over. Suggest that that shows that Native Americans were gone from that region or have suggested that King Philip's War meant that Native Americans no longer lived in um, New England or in regions of New England or suggested the same about King William's War. What they've shown in their research, however, is that even when peoples are, uh, Native peoples are expelled from these wars, their descendants often come back you know, a decade later, generations later, and they do run into trouble. In many cases, um, Euro-Americans, English settlers who have taken up these lands, you know, don't recall that the original deeds included the language that reserved hunting, fishing, etc. rights to Native Americans. Um, they chase them off. They have the authorities chase them off. In some cases, these, um, in some cases, these cases do go before judges who do kind of drag out the old deeds and realize, okay, they have the right to be here, but often um, put limitations on the degree to which they can take resources or tell them, okay, you can hunt here, but don't go there, this sort of thing, which contravenes the original language of the deeds until sort of over time as these towns become cities, as they incorporate, these, these deed rights are just forgotten, are effectively eliminated by judicial or legislative fiat, basically. But uh, there are generations of Norwatuks and peoples from other places in the Connecticut River Valleys who continue to take advantage, who remember um, that they should have the rights to hunt or fish in these places and continue to do so uh, well into the 19th century. Great, thank you. Um, I don't have any other questions or comments at this time. Um, are, have you come across in your research a lot of other stories like Alcantara who illustrate these, um, these stories and um, just these relationships? Are there a lot of that that you found or is this something that's really hard to come by? As you said, his voice isn't strictly represented. You have to kind of piece it together from um, the settler's perspective. It's very hard to come by. Um, I should have looked up some names. Uh, there are some other figures in my book, um, like some of these descendants who, who return to ancestral lands. Um, one gentleman whose last name is uh, Sadakis, can't remember his first name, but who was the grandson of a sachem of one of the Nipmuc bands that are, ch that are expelled from the Connecticut Valley, I believe during King Philip's War, returns uh, as late as the 19th century and sort of travels down the Connecticut River and eventually settles on a Connecticut River tributary So because for him this is a return home. Um, there are other figures who play pivotal roles. There's a Wangunk sachem whose name I don't think is in the records who we know was a key figure in the fur trade in the South until the furs were um, hunted out in uh, those regions, the Connecticut regions of um, the Connecticut River Valley. And then he becomes a land trader and eventually during, I believe the Pequot War, he's actually taken prisoner and held hostage to force the Wongongs to side with the English during the Pequot War. So there are a lot of very interesting stories that you can get you can kit the tip of the iceberg. It's very hard to get down to see the iceberg, I guess. Um, just like with Umpancella, the resources aren't there. We have to see what we can deduce about him based upon his historical context. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions in chat. We also have somebody with their hand raised. Um, did you wanna turn on your mic to ask a question or did you have something in? Oh, there we go. I can, yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so I have an ancestor who Roland Stebbins, who signed the 1658 deed. And I, it was so moving to read all the names, the native names of the land and the landscape. Um, I'm wondering, given <laughs> pensions, it sounds so greedy, his kind of, well, now I get it because he didn't give me the beaver. I'm wondering if you have a sense whether Pinchon kind of expected this to play out the way it did, that if he had a sense that the beaver were decreasing and he, this was his way to get the land. Um, I definitely get that sense. So by the time we reach about 1660, uh, if we look at earlier decades, the English were very, very enthusiastic about trading with Native Americans for furs, beaver, 
Fox Martin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was the focus of English traders. They wanted to trade for furs. By the time we get to certainly the 1640s, 50s, and uh, 60s and later, and the timing varies from place to place, um, up uh, earlier in the lower valley, uh, later in the upper valley, by the time we get to the 1660s, certainly, English traders are becoming increasingly interested in not furs, but Native American lands. So Pynchon would have taken furs, but by this period, he's definitely, he has become a major broker in sort of this business of taking lands out of Native American hands and using them to form English towns. Like he has his hands in the formation of most of the English towns founded in the Connecticut Valley over the course of the 17th century. And this is, I mean, what we see happening with uh, Umpunchal and the Nuwatex is the central part of this. So I think Pynchon expected to get the land out of Umpunchala, but, you know, if he had gotten a large number of furs, he could have rolled with that and probably come back a few more years later and tried again to get those lands. Thanks. Um, let's see, from Cynthia, I don't actually know the history of the Agawams. I don't know their history kind of after the purchase of the lands around Springfield. So I'm afraid, I'm sorry, Cynthia, I'm looking at all of these boxes and not seeing, oh, Cynthia, there it is. Um, I, I'm afraid I just can't speak to that point, and I apologize for that. Um, Betsy McKee asks, Ah, this is an excellent question from Betsy. Were beaver furs then found elsewhere? Did they remain popular in Europe as a trade good? And did anyone eat the beaver meat? Um, both of them, I guess all of them, excellent questions. So essentially what we see is the fur trade kind of marches across North America. So when beaver disappear from New England, which is fairly southerly, for beaver ranges, for the uh, for sort of thick beaver furs. When beaver are hunted out of New England, you see traders moving west into the Hudson River Valley where the Mohawks continue to operate. You see the Mohawks themselves uh, sending hunters and warriors into um, regions of the Ohio River Valley, actually subjugating peoples in the Ohio River Valley and extracting beaver furs from them. So as we move into the later 17th century, the Mohawks are actually extracting beaver from the Ohio River Valleys. Um, farther north in New France, you have French traders moving ever farther west, uh, trading for furs from the, the uh, Wendats, the Hurons, certainly, from the peoples of the Anishinaabe Confederacy. So basically what we just see is as the decades roll on, the fur trade just kind of rolls west across the North American um, continent until by the late 19th century, it's reached the Pacific Ocean. Actually, it reaches the Pacific Ocean in the late 18th century, but it kind of fills in the interior then in um, the 19th century. So yes, these furs remain in high demand throughout the 17th century. See a little bit of dip in demand in the late 18th century, but there, you can still find a good market for them in Europe deep into the 19th century. Um, and as the 20th century approaches, you need fur farms and stuff like that. And then of course people recognize that fur trapping is cruel and fur farming is cruel. So the bottom's fallen out, but that's far more than you asked for. Uh, did people eat the beaver? Yes, Native American hunters made use of the beaver as food. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that they, in some cases they may have taken beaver, skinned them and just taken the furs, but they also, there's evidence that they ate them, that they ate um, all the fleshy parts, that the tail, for some nations were considered a delicacy. Um, we have some French authors as well telling us that um, beaver tail was a great delicacy. Um, for French traders and French, mis French missionaries living in um, what is today Canada, beaver flesh was actually in high demand. Uh, Native American traders would take the furs but also sell the flesh to the French because the Pope had declared, actually no, I believe it was a French bishop had declared that beaver were fish, which meant you could eat it on Fridays and during feast days. So yeah, people ate the beaver as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one question um, from a little bit earlier. Uh, someone asked, what can you say about the effects on the environment when the beavers were gone? Um, a lot. So 
about it over the course of the 17th century and really over the course of the decades, really just from the 16 teens, maybe to the 1680s, beaver disappear from Southern New England, from Massachusetts, Connecticut, probably Rhode Island, and um, uh, certainly Eastern New Hampshire. Um, they're probably on their last legs in a lot of Vermont, um, Northern New Hampshire, and large, large sections of Maine as well. And this has major ecological consequences because beaver um, are sort of famously ecological engineers, right? They build dams, the dams back up water on rivers and streams, the beaver fit build their lodges in there and that provides them with protection from predators. It also provides them with um, pond plants that they consume along with the trees that they cut down. Um, these ponds can flood acres upon acres. They also tend to raise the water table in their general region. I estimate in my work that the disappearance of beaver from the Connecticut River Valley um, from the 16 teens to the 1680s probably led to the drying out of about 900,000 um, acres of wetlands, of ponds, of standing water, and of wetlands, which obviously has wide-reaching consequences for uh, biodiversity. Um, it eliminates the habitat for large numbers of um, marsh-dwelling animals. Um, it changes the sorts of habitats available for different species of fish. It eliminates habitats for some species of fish. Um, plus side, it seems to eliminate enough mosquito habitat that malaria, which was a major scourge of the Connecticut Valley in the 17th century, is gone from the region by the 18th century, um, except around Deerfield, where there's a uh, there's a particularly stubborn swampy area, a former lake that apparently breeds enough mosquitoes that malaria never disappears from Deerfield, but disappears from the rest of the Connecticut Valley and it seems the rest of New England. And we can only assume because of all of these beaver ponds and beaver marshes that have been drained. So lots of stuff, yeah. All right. Well, I don't have any other questions or comments in the chat box um, and uh, we're also past our hour. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us and uh, thank, uh, thank you to Professor Strother Roberts for joining us as well. Really appreciate you taking the time to put this together um, and sharing the story with us. Uh, we just have a comment, um, it was fabulous. Thank you so much, for, so informative. Um, so again, thank you all. Thank you, Professor Roberts. I hope you have a great night and you'll join us again soon. Yes, and thank you everyone for all your questions. Thank you for coming out tonight, for staying in tonight and um, <laughs> listening to the talk. I very much appreciate it. And of course, thank you again uh, to you, Becky, for having me here in my, my office pleasure. this evening. Yes, thank you, right. everyone.